Um, so I'm going to talk about um, genetic testing of honeybees for beekeepers. Um, and basically, I'm going to be talking about a community interest company um, called Bee Bites um, that we set up last year. Um, I just need to say that this uh, lecture was kindly sponsored by the CB Dennis Trust. To summarise what I'm going to talk about, um, I'm basically going to introduce the company we set up, Bee Bites. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some background to how that came about and the thought processes behind it. Then I'm going to tell you about how the product um, that we launched last year, which was MC Lineage Testing, you know, used on an IPLEX mass array, how that works. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about our aspirations for research development and, and some research that we're already involved in. BBATS is basically three people. Um, there's myself. I'm a, I'm, so I'm a molecular biologist, a research scientist. Um, I work at the Roslyn Innovation Centre, which is uh, next to the Roslyn Institute. I um, worked at the Roslyn Institute for the previous decade, where I did um, quite a bit of honeybee research. I'm also a Scottish expert bee master. And also in the company, I've got there's David Ragg. So he's a research scientist at the Roslyn Institute, and he's got expertise in statistical genetics and bioinformatics. He's not a beekeeper. And Matthew Richardson, who is an information scientist at the University of Edinburgh, and he's also a Scottish expert bee master. So we've basically got a mix of you know beekeeper, beekeeper expertise and uh, and research science and bioinformatics and data. So to introduce uh, David Ragg, so, um, so David Ragg, um, since I've known him, has been working on dog, cattle and honeybee genomics at the Roslyn Institute. His expertise includes um, population structure and admixture, which is uh, I think was quite useful for um, what we're going to be talking about. Also identifying genetic associations for traits under selection. So that's like looking for the bits of DNA that are, re are responsible for specific traits. Um, previous to that, he worked at the Institut National de la Recherche Agronomique France, and he, there he, le he was leading a project to characterise honeybee genetics throughout France. I'll tell you about uh, Matthew Richardson. So me and Matthew Richardson um, have been bee beekeeping together. We went, we went through all the module examinations in a study group together and um, we've been on the National Diploma of Beekeeping courses together, so we've done quite a lot of beekeeping together. Um, Matthew's an information scientist at the University of Edinburgh. As I, say, as I said before, he's a Scottish expert bee master. He's also the Science and Health Officer for the Scottish Beekeepers Association. I also believe he's about to be elected to Vice President of the Scottish Beekeepers Association. Um, he's the manager of the University of Edinburgh Apiary Project. He was the first person to establish an apiary at the University of Edinburgh. I think that's been there since 2008. I also have, have an, an apiary out at the Easter Bush campus where the Roslyn Institute stands. He's a basic and intermediate beekeeping certificate examiner. He manages swarms for Edinburgh and Midlothian Beekeepers Association. And that kept him quite busy last year because we had a load of um, rooftop hives and, um, and they were basically abandoned and, um, yeah, the, the, Matthew had to coordinate sorting all that out so there wasn't absolute havoc in the centre of Edinburgh. There's nothing like a swarm on Princess Street to get um, get people excited. Anyway, with this um, swarm, swarm control he does for the association, he's, he, he's also written this web app to help the public identify bees and wasps, which is called Bee Dentify, and, um, which is quite useful because you don't want to turn up for a swarm and it's just some wasps or, or some bumblebees or something like that. Okay, setting up the company. So we, we, we formed the company legally in December 2020. We had a lot of help from the University of Edinburgh. This is the, um, the Roslyn Innovation Centre. I work in here and also um, we also do the Bee Bites stuff in here. And um, basically there's a lot of startup businesses in here, you know, scientific research startups. I think they were quite keen to, to, for us to do a bee related startup and they were quite interested that it was a community interest company and not for profit. So we got quite a lot of help from the university and a lot of advice in how to set the company up. So we've got office space in, in the Innovation Centre um, since April 2021. And we've also got a bit of laboratory space and basically we've, we've, so we, we can do DNA extraction. It, um, we could also do PCR, 
We could also do qPCR. qPCR is, is the technique that you use to do the COVID testing. I've done a lot of PCR in my life. In fact, I generally do PCR every day, actually. qPCR, you could use that to test for, you know, um, the RNA B viruses. Most of the B viruses are, are RNA based. Um, so we've got a little bit of scope there. <clears throat> So B-Bytes, as I said, is a community interest company. The full name is B-Bytes Analytics CIC, and that's because there was another company called B-Bytes that did something with computers, but they kind of let's use the, uh, the name. Um, it's not for profit. There's no shareholders or dividends, and, any, and the profits will be used to benefit the community. We had financial support from the University of Edinburgh to set it up. We also had support from a social entrepreneurs fund called First Port. And so basically, B-Bytes has got expertise in honeybee genomics, beekeeping, bioinformatics, statistical genetics, large-scale data analysis, and software engineering. So our aim is basically to provide low-cost services. And so we're interested in tests that we can do for beekeepers that are relatively um, straightforward and easy for us to do. Aiming to give beekeepers easy access to, to, these testing, to this testing. We've got with aspirations to um, become involved in environmental consultancy. Data that we're going to, that's going to come through B-Bytes, we're, we're, we're going to be, uh, have an open data policy on that, and we're going to make that data freely available uh, for all. Any profits will be reinvested in research and development, um, outreach, and promotion of pollinator health and biodiversity. Um, so this is the product we launched last year. So this is the MC Lineage Admixture Assay, which is run on a machine called an IPLEX Mass Array. Now, an IPLEX Mass Array is, is quite an expensive piece of equipment. So B-Bytes doesn't own one of these, and so we basically use one at the Northern um, Genetics Service uh, in Newcastle upon Tyne. They're quite an expensive piece of equipment, and there's not that many of them around. So the sample that, that we're, we, we get you to send in is basically 15 pupil drone antenna. And that's enough to get the genotype of the queen for the, um, the single nucleotide polymorphisms um, that we're looking at. The cost is £49 per colony, and we aim to turn around in three to four weeks. And then the result you'll, re you'll receive is um, an estimate of um, Apis mellifera and mellifera ancestry, whether you've got a good example of, of AMM or, or whether you're hybridised. Um, the test uh, is 95% accurate. Yeah, and you can compare it um, across different generations of bees. Okay, so the process. So what do you do? So you basically go to the website and you place your order. So then we will dispatch a DNA collection kit with, with full instructions. So what you will do then is you will go out um, to the colony you want to test and you'll you will basically need to uncap some, uh, some drone pupa from your colony, because obviously we, we can't take adult drones because as we all know, they drift between colonies. So if we want to test that colony, we got, we're going to take them from that colony. So basically, you see these drones have been uncapped. And then we basically take an antenna from 15 single drone pupa. You'll then put that in the tube. Um, we provide some forceps for you to assist with that. Then it's recommended that you basically leave that tube basically just leave it overnight with, with the antenna in the solution and then post it back to us. So then we'll get it tested, we'll, we'll receive the data and we'll process the data and then um, we will pass the data back to you. Um, and as I say, all, all the collected data we're going to use and make it freely available. So what we're aiming to do is basically feed this data into a map so um, obviously the results will be anonymized. We're going to work in, on 10, in 10 kilometer squares. And so the idea is that um, you'll be able to basically look at your area and, and see percentage M lineage in your, overall in your area. Because um, <clears throat> obviously if, it, if you're in a, an area where there's you know, predominantly C lineage, then it's probably not going to be a, an ideal place to keep um, native honeybees, is it? And you might want to, you know, travel a little way to your apiary. So that's basically what we're doing with that. So um, the background to setting up B-Bytes. 
So this basically all started for me with a, a trip to Kludzhnapoka, which is, which is in Romania, in Transylvania. And um, my reason for going there was the European, the seventh European B conference in 2016. And it was there I met um, Alice Pinto, um, who was a, a research scientist from Portugal, and she's, um, she's done a lot of work on black bees. And so she was basically developing this low-cost genotyping platform to identify M and C lineage. And she was looking for someone to sa take some samples from the UK. To design this platform, she basically took 117 carefully selected single nucleotide polymorphisms. I'll just explain, just go over that. So a single, all a single nucleotide polymorphism is, is the commonest form of genetic variation. And if we have our reference genome here, which we compare things that we sequence against. So this could be the, there's a, one, there's a DH4 reference genome um, in the USA based on C lineage. There's also a, um, a black bee reference genome, which is based on bees from Wissant off the west coast of France. So you can see here in the reference genome, we've got an A, yeah, and this has been changed in our sample to a G. So that is a single nucleotide polymorphism. And if, you know, DNA has four bases, so you'd, you'd think that you could get, you know, you'd get the other three bases for the SNPs, but gen generally most SNPs are always just one, one or two bases. There's only one, you don't get, a, you know, a variety of four, you only get two. So, so basically I submitted 96 samples from the UK, including some samples from the B4 project um, that are, um, in Cornwall. What Alice was analysing was basically one, one worker bee per colony. Um, this is where those um, bees were taken from. So we've got, um, I collected these ones in, from Scotland, um, B4 project in Cornwall, got some from Shropshire. If we look at the key to what we've got here, the, the largest circles are ones that have been subjected to whole genome sequencing. That was a, um, an, an example of an imported carniolan that we sequenced at Roslyn. Um, that was a book fast. And we also sequenced um, colon C. And, um, and also we've got um, protected apiaries shown by a star. So obviously the Col Isle of Collins is a protected apiary. There's some protected apiaries in France and Switzerland. And so um, Alice then did something called an admixture analysis. Um, admixture is the result of breeding between two or more previously isolated po populations within a species. Basically it's, it's a computer program to analyse the proportion of genetic backgrounds. When you do it, you assume the number of genetic backgrounds. So you can assume two backgrounds or three backgrounds or four backgrounds so as we're just looking at m and c lineage you know uh, the, the most um, pertinent one is two backgrounds and so just to explain how you've, you've all seen these admixture graphs but um just to see how these are put together if it, it starts like this where we've got here um a b with 100 percent estimated amn ancestry here with one with 100 percent estimated c lineage and, and ancestry and um hybrids in between and then you put all those together and you get this graph here and we can see that we're doing quite well for conservation of uh, AMM in Ireland and Scotland and there were a few good samples there but they were from the B4 project in Cornwall. That, that was um, published in uh, 2018 in a, in a journal called Scientific Reports. So um, whilst sourcing the bees, um, I, I, contacted, I contacted Andrew Brown, to, um, who's the uh, director of the B4 project. Basically, I was just um, you know, looking for some ag examples of um, dark bees. And um, anyway, Andrew sourced, kindly sourced single uh, work honey bees from colonies uh, from Cornwall. And anyway, as a result of that, and helping us with the, with the Alice Pinto's project, um, I was subsequently invited to speak at the B4, uh, a B4 meeting at the Eden Project in 2018. And, and there I met Professor Mary Knight and a PhD student, Victoria Buswell, who was doing a project um, on, on black bees in Cornwall. I ended up setting up the genotyping platform with, um, with the B4 project. And then and we used, basically we tested more bees in Cornwall and we also tested some for Victoria, to contribute towards, towards her PhD. Um, having set up the you know the genotyping platform um, at the Northern Jack Service in Newcastle um, 
but then the idea was, well, why don't we run this as a service for the beekeepers in UK and Ireland? And so that was the, where we formed, formed Bee Bites with David and Matthew, uh, December 2020. So I'll, uh, I'm going to tell you how the IPLEX mass array works. Um, so obviously I, I've actually never seen the machine. <laughs> so I'm going to have to take it. I'll have to, <laughs> it's time for a trip to Newcastle, I think. But, um, okay, so... So basically, the way it works, it works by PCR and mass spectrometry. So you amplify DNA, and then you are able to detect which single nucleotide polymorphism you've got. Um, <clears throat> I have no experience of mass spectrometry, but basically the principle is to generate ions from either inorganic or organic compounds by any suitable method, and then to separate these ions by their mass to charge ratio and to detect them qualitatively and quantitatively by their respective mass to charge ratio and abundance. So, as I do know considerably more about PCR, so basically what you need for your PCR is your DNA sample. So this will come from, so those drone antenna will we'll, we'll extract the DNA from them. So we need that. And then we, we need um, primers. These are short pieces of DNA and they're going to amplify be used to amplify the specific piece of DNA where that single nucleotide polymorphism is that we're interested in. So to do that, to do the, um, the genotyping platform, you're going to need 117 pairs of those, but not in the same tube. Okay. The other thing you need is you need nucleotides. So these are basically the basic building blocks of DNA. So they've, they've got a base and a sugar and a phosphate, and, and then you've got an enzyme it's um, TAC, um, called TAC polymerase. I mean, PCR was invented in the 1980s um, and it was an absolute revolution for molecular biology. And um, basically TAC polymerase, it can basically be heated up and get damaged a bit, but it can, it can survive quite high temperatures. And the reason for that is it was isolated from an organism called Thermus aquaticus, which lives in um, hot geysers. So, um, and that's where, they, that's where they cloned it from. So basically you mix those up and you put them in a PCR tube, and then you put them in the PCR machine, and then basically what the PCR machine is going to cycle, it's going to do three, it basically cycle between three temperatures. So all it's going to do is going to go about 95 degrees, maybe for about 15 seconds, and then it'll cool down to 55 degrees or, 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 or thereabouts, depending on your particular assay, and maybe for, you know, 15, 20 seconds. And then, and then it'll, then it'll heat to 72, which is the temperature that the tap polymerase likes to extend the bases. So the reason it, you cool it down to the 55-ish temperature is so the primers will anneal on. So I've just uh, demonstrated that here. Here's our DNA with our target region. So our single nucleotide polymorphism is going to be in here somewhere. If we heat DNA up, it goes into, it separates into two, sing, into two single strands. Then you cool it down. To somewhere around 55 degrees and then these short primers, short pieces of DNA, they find the sequence where they match. Then you heat 72 and it, the, basically the tap polymerase extends and so you make, you're going to basically make a copy, this is going to make a copy of that strand, that's going to make a copy of that strand. And so if you do one cycle you're going to get two copies and then, sorry, another cycle, four copies, and then eight copies, 16 copies, 32 copies. So before you know it, just like, uh, you know, replicating bee colonies, you know, if you doubled your bee colonies every year, you'd soon have, you'd soon be the biggest bee farmer in the UK, wouldn't you? So you get a lot of molecules. So we basically amplify um, the piece of DNA we're interested in. So... So the IPLEX mass array basically can, it can identify, so you can identify single nucleotide polymorphisms and you need as little as five nanograms um, DNA to put in. So a nanogram is, there's a gram and down from a gram there's a milligram, that's a thousand times down from, from a, a gram and then there's a microgram and then there's a nanogram, they're all a thousand times down so it's quite a low amount. And basically you need to do one PCR, one of those PCR reactions per SNP. And what you can do on the, uh, on the, the IPLEX, and presumably the reason it's called PLEX, is you can actually put a number of these PCR reactions in one tube. So, 
basically you can analyse up to 40 different SNPs in one reaction tube. So, and this is, this is called multiplex PCR. And the reason I'm telling you this is because if you, if, you, if you look at that paper that I've told you about, you'll see a lot of mention of M1, M2, M3 and M4. <laughs> and, then that, and you'll understand what that means now, hopefully. That, um, so basically, the, the assay has four different um, pools of PCRs. Yeah? So the, these, are, and these have got up to 40 PCRs done in this one, this one, this one and this one. So if physically, that would be just four tubes. Yeah. One of the things that I learned during the process was because I thought, wouldn't it be good if I could put some mitochondrial SNPs on it as well? Yeah, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Then I could test my mitochondria. However, apparently, the multiplex PCR is initially um, it's very time-consuming to set up, and it's, it would actually be easier to design a completely new assay. Than, to, than like to take one of the SNPs out and add it onto one of those. So they take quite a lot of setting up these multiplex PCRs to get them right, basically. So, and this shows admixture analysis, like, just like the graph I sold you, but this time, I think there's 561 samples here that we're looking at. And, that, and that, so basically the black showing you the M lineage it's with four, the, the four of those assays, which is looking at 117 SNPs. And then if we do it, we could do it with two, the M1 and the M3, or the M2 and the M4. And you can see you get a quite a similar result with just using two of them. Okay, so research and development. So as well as, as, well as um, offering the MC lineage test, we're also interested in working with beekeeping groups. The talk I gave um, at the Eden project in 2018, I I was saying that whole genome sequencing was getting cheaper and cheaper and it was becoming within the range of beekeepers and um, anyway we've so basically we've recently been involved in a project with B4 project and pollinize uh, it went in pursuit of the Salonian honeybee and so the Isles of Scilly is a, a group of islands 25 miles off the southwest tip of Cornwall um, it's thought to be varroa free and um, Nick Bentham Green from Bibber was interested in studying honeybees on the Sillies. When Jilly Halliday of Bibber moved to the Isle of Tresco in April 2019, he thought that, that there was an opportunity there to start a project. And their original aim was to establish um, AMM, AMM, but they've, I think they've now decided to work with a locally adapted bee. And so um, for that, um, we've collected, well, they collected, um, we've done the DNA and uh, the sequencing. They collected um, drone people from 11 colonies in 2021. Um, that data is currently being analysed, so we're expecting very shortly to know a lot about the uh, bees on the Isles of Scilly and their genetics. And I'll say we sequenced five drone people per colony. We also collected 30 worker bees per colony. Um, these were collected for microbiome analysis. And the microbiome, basically, when you sequence a bee, you don't just sequence the bee, you sequence everything else that's in the bee. So if, if, so if we collect a a pool of 30 workers and we sequence them we're going to get an idea of a um, good idea of um, the pathogens in the uh, within those bees and well within that colony and we'll also get the um, the bacteria that live in the guts of the bee so the the, the, the basically the, the honeybee gut is based usually based on about nine bacteria which we've detected here Giliomella apicola snodgrassella um, we've got Lactobacillus um, Bartonella. We're not looking at one colony here. This was some research at the Roslyn Institute, and we're actually looking at pathogens in 19 colonies in total. Um, so we detected no seen rapis and serrana, and um, also their chalk brood and their trypanosome um, called Lotmeria passim. Um, so the insect gut microbiome is important, and, and that's of interest as well. It's important for metabolic function, um, host immune stimulation, uh, resistance to pathogens. Um, as I mentioned, the taxonomic diversity is low, and 95% of the gut microbiota has nine bacterial species, um, which we detected in, in that analysis. Um, and the new, newly emerged bees are essentially axenic, and what that means is that the gut, they basically acquire their gut microbiota in the first few days when, when after they emerge. So there's not much point in uh, 
looking at a, a worker bee that's just emerged, you, you won't find much out about its microbiome. But we think the microbiome has, has, a, has a potential, um, both for diagnostic tests and, and also probiotic treatments for bees. Uh, David um, Rag has also, he's been putting together this haplotype map, and this now, I think, I think he's now got 1,500 drone, whole genome drone sequences within it. The useful thing about um, drone genomes is they're haploid, so we can sequence the order of the single nucleotide polymorphisms along the chromosomes very easily and basically find out these haplotypes where you know haplotypes is a series of single nucleotide polymorphisms that tend to be inherited together and so basically um, we can use that to look for where there's been selective pressure on areas of the genome and you can do that by testing um, evidence for one set of basically one set of haplotypes to another so if these are the 16 chromosomes and these, these are in um, the C lineage Bs we're looking at. We're comparing the haplotypes with, with, with basically the other um, lineages of Bs, so the, uh, the M lineage and um, the A lineage and the O lineage. And if you look at this area here, you can see we've got this area of significance in the C lineage Bs compared to the others. And basically what that represents is if you, if you look here, these so horizontally, we've got basically um, individual drone, drones, and you can see these little blue squares and little gold squares. So the blue squares represent a SNP that is the same as the reference genome we're using, and the gold squares are where, where they've got the different base. And so you can see that they're all, they're all lined up, they're all the same. Whereas in the M lineage here, you've basically got this mosaic. So this is a good way of, of getting it um, you know the the, uh, the DNA regions. You can imagine if we could look at you know we could look at a nosema, get drones from a nosema resistant population, and then start to get at the D the DNA that might be behind that. And there's also here an example for M lineage, where in this region all the all the SNPs are the same. Um, the other thing that David has been working on. Is, um, is something called a graph genome, uh, which he's getting very excited about. And so basically, um, when we line up sh um, sequencing, which is short read, short read sequencing, short reads are about 100 to 150 bases, um, there's problems when we line them up, you know, because usually they're lined up to a reference genome, which is usually based on one queen bee. And um, basically, you get problems because if, you, if you're lining up... Um, reads from, um, let's say, a colon CB to the DH4 C lineage strain genome, basically, if the, in, in, between the genomes, there'll have been different various things that go on, um, like deletions, uh, insertions, duplications, pieces of DNA turning around. And so they've been, at Rosalind, they've been coming up with this um, graph genome. So basically, instead of doing that, you're going to be lining up to basically all the genomes available. I think David's now talking about um, lining up to five honeybee genomes. Um, and um, he also thinks, which is of interest to us, is that basically he thinks doing this, he can develop a more accurate model-free um, ancestry estimate. Um, everything I spoke about before was based on uh, models. Um, we're also interested in um, sequencing bees um, from museums, and we were about just before the pandemic started. We um, we were about to go into the museum in Scotland in Edinburgh and get some samples, and then and then the pandemic hit, and so um, we're, we're 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 keen to, to restart that. Um, so obviously we're looking for um, we're looking for examples of um, the black bee before the 1920s. And then <clears throat> just to conclude. So this, so this is the this is the IPLEX um, mass array, and here we can see we've basically um, got an admixture plot here, and we're we're basically comparing the 117 SNPs of the IPLEX against whole genome sequencing. This will be in 560 individual drones, and you can see that the IPLEX gives a very good approximation of what you actually get from sequencing everything. And if you, if you correlate that, you get an R squared by 0.94, which is really good. So basically, it basically does what it says on the tin, and it, when, you, when you want to um, 
look at your M lineage and C lineage ancestry. So thanks very much for your attention and happy to take any questions. Uh, you said at the start with the little coloured squares of all the different blocks where the genetics of the bee were different to the ones you might want to introduce and that might not be a good idea. But when they looked at the mitochondrial DNA of a lot of those black bees down in Cornwall, didn't they start off as Italian bees and turn into black bees? Yeah, well that's because, so the mitochondria goes down the female line, yeah? So if you so, wouldn't you introduce your bees, wouldn't they all turn into a black bee eventually if you didn't bring any more Italian queens in? Um, we, have, we have actually um, found bees that have basically got, you know, they're essentially AMM with a C lineage of mitochondria. Yeah. And, you, and, uh, and that's just going to go down the female line, so, so you won't get rid of it, will you? You won't get rid of it completely, yeah. but... But you might not, I mean, it might, you might not be bothered about it either. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, what exactly is your reference sample? And what happens if the reference sample is significantly different from the bees before the 1920s? Right. So we can only go, right, you, you get your reference genome, and basically that is going to be based, it's going to be based on morphology and behaviour on how you choose that bee. You, you could also, well obviously, you can also, obviously you can look at the mitochondria, that would be a good idea, it's got M lineage mitochondria, if we're talking about the M lineage reference. So basically, that, that bee from the Isle of Wisson, um, basically, you, you, you basically come back to morphology, anatomy and behaviour to get your reference. Obviously, it's got different genetics to the sea lineage bees, so, but, but in terms of, you know, that's why we're interested in doing the museum bees, because that will, you know, that will really uh, tell you what a, you know, completely what, what a black bee was. That's why we're going. That's why we're going back with the museum bees. Yeah. Just a thought about the museum bees. There aren't any um, Isle of Wight bees, dead bees, museum specimens around that we could identify. What really caused Isle of Wight disease? <laughs> Whole genome sequencing. See so what the virus, Isle of Wight or? disease. So we, we now think, don't we think Isle of Wight disease was caused by chronic bee paralysis virus? It um, could be. Yeah, it's of, all speculation, of, isn't it? Lack so. of forage, etc. Yeah. So, so well, the, the one thing about so chronic bee paralysis virus is, is a, um, based on RNA. Yeah. So yeah. The, the th yeah. RNA is quite an unstable molecule, yeah. and um, the, we wouldn't detect it last year, never mind <laughs> from the 1920s. Yeah. So, yeah. so I don't think that's doable. Yeah. Fair point. Oh, yes. Um, um, yeah, so uh, the traditional taxonomy of honeybees was defined on multivariate morphometry, wasn't it? Has, any, has anyone ever tried to sort of correlate to see whether that and the genetics are perfectly aligned? Or? Right. I, yes, I have had a look at that, right? So, so, so basically, obviously, wing morphometry has been used a lot, right? And, and, and wing morphometry is a very good thing, a very good tool to identify a lot of species of insects, right? However, the problem here comes with um, the hybridisation, I think. So, so basically, if you go to the Isle of, if you go to the Isle of Colonsy, right, and you do wing morphometry on, on all of Andrew Abrams' co colonies, yeah, they'll all be in that, you know, the red box on the morphometry, they'll all be in there, yeah? And if you do it on some sea lineage, those Carney Owens and those Bookfast, it'll be, they'll all be where they should be for C lineage. So what I did, what I have done a bit of, um, I, I, correl I did correlate, you know, obviously you can correlate these, this MC lineage and you can correlate that with your wing morphometry. And I didn't get a good correlation. So I think, I think it's, I don't think it's very good for identifying the level of hybridization. Right, yes, yeah, there's, well, there's, um, so there's tomentum. I mean, there's people here who are going to know a lot more about this than me, but there's tomentum hairs, isn't there? The bands um, and how, how thick those bands are on the abdomen. 
So I we now I did start I did start with that, but um, I, I don't think I was trying to get people to do those measurements for me actually. But, uh, so we didn't get very far with that. But you, you're quite right; those all of those things could be correlated. We should probably we should probably look into we should probably look into that. Uh, I noticed that you asked for drone samples from individual colonies and worker samples for whole apiary testing. Now, as a queen rearer, if I'm looking for a breeder queen, I'm interested in what she's producing yeah. and not what she's made of. That's right. So I would be more interested in work or something there. Yeah. And as my mate in apiaries, I'm interested in what the drones are that yeah. are flying around. So I'd have chosen the other way around. Yeah. So the reason for doing it in drones, right, is the accuracy. Yeah. Because you know how many... How many how many, I mean, I know, I know the standard thing is that the queen mates with 10 to 12 workers, but there's the stuff in the scientific literature that it can be up to 50, yeah. So if we do the drones, right, if we do 15 drone antenna, we'll get, we'll get everything, basically. And if we do workers, how many do we have to do? If we've got rare patrol lines, etc., how many do we have to do? Quite a lot. So we've, we've actually done an experiment because we had the exact conversation with the Scottish Native Honey Bee Society because they want to do workers, yeah. So we've done an experiment where we've taken um, different numbers of, um, of workers. So um, and, and we're basically going to do a comparison of, um, of doing different numbers of them. So we are, we, are, we, are address, we are addressing that, but the reason for doing drones is, is the accuracy. And I realise it's, like, it's behind the curve, isn't it? You're sort of behind the curve. But it's not just us. There's, there was a, there's a company in Switzerland, Switzerland called Apigenics. They they also came to the decision to do drones. I think that was ba that, again based on the scientific accuracy. So I think for a breeder, I think the recommendation would be to test your breed queens and test your drone colonies. Um, but I, yeah, you, you're quite correct. Um, the best if we could do doing the, the workers would be best, but um, we're not sure of the accuracy of that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.